Hi there. So this is actually my first dice. I feel like I've been around for a while, but it is my first dice. And I've got to say, listening to the presentations this morning, I'm just pretty overwhelmed by the sheer level of craftsmanship, both in terms of building some of the games that I've grown up, you know, I grew up loving, as well as building some of the companies that I admire the most today. And as I grew up myself, I was actually heartbroken by figuring out that finally I was never going to be a good enough coder or good enough at drawing or animating or any of those things to sort of create the form of art that I love. But what I did instead over time was actually to develop a craft, if you like, of my own, mainly derived from the fact that I didn't have too many talents in other areas, which was around building successful game teams and game companies right at the bleeding edge of where the games industry is heading. And through, I've been very fortunate in that journey, in that the three other companies that I was part of building in different roles turned out to really push the boundaries of the industry uh, in one way or another. And the company that I'm working with now, Super Hero Megacorp, we're still at the very early stages of our journey, but it's certainly something that we are hoping to do in terms of core gaming on touchscreens. So my journey started really with Glue Mobile. Back then, my company was called Macrospace. We formed the European half of what became Glue Mobile. Um, that was a feature phones business. I spent seven years building it from scratch, from nothing, when the first phones came out that could support downloadable content, all the way to an IPO in 2007. I then left in order to create Playfish, one of the true social gaming pioneers that created games um, on what ended up being Facebook and other social networks and grew um, very rapidly from there. And then um, I, was, I spent some time at EA, but I was also very fortunate to be the very first investor into Supercell and spent some time on the board of that company, uh, arguably one of the most successful game companies on any platform today with three of the world's top 10 uh, touchscreen titles with um, Clash of Clans, Boom Beach, um, and Heyday. And after that, um, I'm today, as I said, uh, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Super Evil Megacorp, uh, creators of Vainglory, the MOBA perfected for touch, um, and really focused on pushing uh, the boundaries of the games industry by inspiring core gamers to take on touch screens as their primary gaming platform. So clearly none of us here make games to make money, um, but commercial success does matter because if you create commercial success that enables you to reinvest in your game, the game that you want to make, and um, for me, what I've, you know, what I've done over the past 15 years has really created a lot of scars, if you like, in my experience. I certainly uh, have learned a lot of painful lessons, made a lot of bad decisions, made some good decisions, but learned a lot across the board. And what I was hoping to share was some of those scars, if you like, some of the things which I think have helped determine which companies ultimately became commercially successful and which didn't in an environment of massive uncertainty. Um, and by the way, like I say that I got into the game industry because of the intersection of technology and art, plus an art form that I love and I've played with you know, since a kid. If you ask my mom, she'll tell you I just played so many games I could never get myself a proper job at all. So that's another route into the game industry. But so Glue Mobile, the feature phone games industry. This was a really interesting time in computer games. Our dream was to take games that you would play in a Game Boy, in Game Boy Advance, and ultimately get those in everyone's pocket. Because you know what? When everyone has a mobile device, everyone could own a Game Boy Advance or a Game Boy. So the title you see there on the screen is a title called Ancient Empires II, a sort of um, Final Fantasy Tactics or Advance War style title, the kind of game that I loved to play at the time. But the business was really hard. You had to, on the one hand, create a game that would run on thousands of devices with different screen sizes, memory constraints, ability, processing power, and all that. And you then had to try to distribute those through a hundreds of carriers who all were kind of the only people who could sell to their own consumers. Super hard. But this was kind of where I cut my teeth as a game maker. Given that I didn't have the talent to code or to draw, I spent all my time instead thinking about how do I find the best people in the world who are really passionate about doing this and then how do I ultimately empower them to go and create the games that they love playing themselves? And that was, to me, a huge thing of thinking about an org structure not as a pyramid of one guy at the top telling everyone else to do, because you know what, that guy was kind of not very talented, but rather, how do you instead think of the org structure the other way around? How do you hire rock stars, and how do you get the, the kind of senior management in a company to instead focus on building the stage for those rock stars and that lead guitarist and the drummer to perform? 
So that was important. But at the same time, though, this part of the industry is I sometimes refer to as the Siberian Gulag, because that's how hard it was. If you knew what it entailed, you would never get into it. And if you survived it, you could survive anything. In fact, the talent that cut their teeth in feature phone gaming in the early 2000s are actually the people today who run companies like Supercell, who are in senior management positions at King.com or at Wugo. Right now, it was just one of those times where um, it was every cent of profit for you to be able to pay your staff at the end of every month was just really hard. And if you couldn't make great games and distribute them well, you were in trouble. So the first lesson of my 10 lessons was that when the market environment is immature, when the conditions are tough out there, keep your burn rates low. What that means is don't try to spend a minimal amount of money. Because it's much better to have a small team tackle a problem for a long time than having a large team that only has a little bit of time to tackle it. So in particular, when you're looking for that aha, that awesome, like what is it that is unique about this medium, this specific new device? People didn't have any preconceived notions of what should gaming feel like on a mobile device. Give yourself time. Embrace the medium. Give yourself time to embrace it. Keep your burn rates low. The winners in this market were exactly the companies that ultimately ended up being very cautious on cost. The second, though, lesson, which is more of a meta lesson, which I think is very, very kind of appropriate for today as we think about things like VR and AR and streaming and all those wonderful things that are happening, new platforms coming into the game industry, is that compound immaturity in a market slows it down dramatically. What that means is that, or what I mean by this is that if you have a client side, if you like, if you have a set of technologies that are immature, if you have a distribution environment which is immature, and you also have a set of consumer expectations that are immature because no one knows really how that platform is going to work or what to expect from it, that means that things will take a very long time to evolve. I remember back in 2004 when my brethren from a company called Jamdat back then went public, we had just launched one of our really big hits in Who Wants to Be a Millionaire on mobile, sold millions of units. I was convinced that in the next two years, we will see the first billion dollar mobile game. That was in 2004. I was literally convinced. We did see the first billion dollar mobile game, but that was in nine years later, in 2013. So that's how long these things can take. And today, obviously, the mobile games market is amazing, but it can take a long time. Thirdly, if you really do want to IPO your game business, and I'm not sure that I would recommend that to anyone, but if you really do want to IPO it, make sure that you don't IPO it after your big growth curve without having had any downturns. Make sure you've had a couple of downturns before so that you have some language to talk to the analysts and explain to them how your business has some ups and has some downs. Because it can be pretty heartbreaking when you have your first little down and the analysts tear you to pieces. Um, no matter how much you try to explain it to them beforehand, they just saw a straight line. The other thing, actually, which was more of a humbling personal lesson from this era for me was when I ultimately made the heartbreaking personal decision to leave Blue, I poured my heart and soul into it for six years, and I decided, okay, now is the day I've got to go build something new. That's what I really want to do. And I was a Section 16 officer, as it's called, so you have to put out a press release. So we put out a press release that I am leaving, and I was sort of in, I wasn't at all totally convinced that that was the right decision. Then I saw, then, what happened was the stock jumped by about 4% out there. And at that point, it was kind of bad, but kind of good, because that, you know what, I, I knew at that moment in time that you know, the market agreed with me, time for me to move on. So, but kind of humbling at the same time. Awesome, but humbling. Um, so my next company that I went on to um, found from there and became the chief exec was Playfish. Here, our dream was to take what Nintendo had done so awesomely with the Nintendo Wii, of turning the camera around, not focusing on the explosions on screen, but focusing on the interplay between the people playing and what Facebook has done online, pre-platform, pre-games, any of that stuff, of just bringing communities together. We thought, what if Nintendo and Facebook had a love child? That's the thing we want to build. Um, an amazing game, that, uh, an amazing company that creates social games online. Learned a lot through this process. I got to, if you like, learn all the things about from building Glue and start again and build a company with a kind of culture and approach to talent that I really wanted to create, which was amazing. We were very lucky. We grew incredibly quickly. We got to pioneer microtransactions in the West that everyone said was, were never going to work. We got to pioneer stuff like appointment game mechanics, viral distribution mechanics, so many new things. It was like a crazy new world that we got to kind of 
learn about. And like one of the main, main lessons for me from all of this stuff was just how important community is. And I did really enjoyed that previous talk because that is true. It is all about the community and working with the community to make your games better. So we grew to over 60 million monthly active users with games like Pet Society, for example, and who has the biggest brain at the time, which were really focused on bringing those communities together. Lots and lots and lots of lessons from this era, as I said. But one pretty interesting one when you think about the future and what kind of companies might be successful is that one of the things that is kind of, if you look at the winners from this era of games, it turns out there is no publishing leverage in digital games. What do I mean by that? Well, in physical games, clearly there's sort of a, almost a 50-50 effort of making the title itself and then making sure that everyone can get access to those boxes, whether you're in a shop or like whichever way that between the marketing programs and all those sort of things that you need to do to get the game out. Turns out in digital games, when they're purely digitally distributed, it actually is predominantly about your authentic interaction with your user base. The way that your and the, the digital app stores and the digital distribution channels tend to actually be fairly straightforward to manage. So there is effort there, but perhaps it's like 90% in the making the game and understanding that the game itself markets itself more than anything else. And the community interaction of the game is the most important part of marketing. And there is still some of the mechanistic publishing bits, but it's much less important. And it's pretty fundamental. The winners of this era all were content creators. None of them were pure publishers. And I think that says something about where, what kind of companies are successful also in the future. So and it also begs the question, does it really make sense to build a publishing organization with multiple studios all around the world? Because if the publishing organization only adds 10% to the studios, is it really worth? And it's interesting. We'll see what kind of companies get built in the future. So, yeah, another small lesson is just like IPOing is kind of complicated, selling your company is also complicated. We became part of EA in 2009. And it does genuinely, and everyone who's ever sold a company knows this, one dream and one adventure ends. Another exciting dream and another exciting adventure does start, but it really is a, um, a if you like, a complete change in how a company operates. Let's talk about Supercell then for a second. So Supercell uh, really pioneered mid-core gaming on touch and has really gone from strength to strength to strength ever since. And what was interesting about Supercell, and just to be clear, I can take absolutely zero credit for any success that Supercell had other than having been very fortunate to be at the right time in the right place in order to fund an incredible team and be able to make coffees for them occasionally and hopefully that's hopefully helped, helped them be a little bit better along the way. But what was incredible about Supercell was the realization right from the start that they were always going to be small. That what they were looking for really is to build these cells. It's all in the name, these super cells of incredible talent put together in order to pursue opportunities. And then create a culture around that where failure is okay. In fact, they famously celebrate failure with champagne. Of you can go out and try to do the best possible thing. And you know what? If it doesn't work out, we'll party and we'll do it again because that's what we're about. Um, so that was pretty amazing. Also, their execution discipline has just been amazing to watch from the outside, and as well as their innovations in marketing and other places. But one of perhaps the most profound takeaway for the future from the Supercell journey has been that talent density matters. It is obvious in computer games, like in, it is in any form of art, that talent matters. You need the best people to do things. But what I think Supercell showed the world was that it's not enough if you like, if you have 10 amazing people, it is much better to put them in one team working on one problem as opposed to get 10 amazing people to recruit 10 different teams working on 10 different problems. In fact, so far so that you could argue that the 100 person company is the new 10,000 person company in games. Because the efficient scale of a gaming company with both the publishing leverage going away as well as the level of automation at every level of a game company these days, from hosting to development tools to everything else, the 100-person company can arguably create a better game company than a 10,000-person company. So it's kind of really interesting to see how that will uh, affect the future of the industry as, as well. So what about super evil Megacorp? We are a collection of industry veterans, very much, if you like, learning all those lessons from some of these past journeys. I was originally an investor in Super Evil Megacorp. One of the co-founders used to be a, a work, I used to work closely with that Playfish, so that's how I knew the crew from the start. But they are really this, they were this incredible collection of senior industry talent from Riot and Blizzard, Insomniac and Ready at Dawn, like all these amazing companies that I've admired. That got together and decided that we are going to be, we are going to start creating a franchise for the very long term. 
How do we bring those really visceral, emotional, exciting gaming experiences that we all grew up with in LAN parties and playing games like Warcraft 3 or Counter-Strike and others, how can we bring those experiences to the touch generation? How can we make sure that people who play on touch screens aren't always bogged down with timers and energy mechanics? How do they get to have the same experiences we had when we grew up? And how do we take that and build a 10-year plus 20-plus year franchise out of all of it? And What's been amazing about that journey has been really to sort of be part of that level of talent across the board, to watch them bring a game like Vainglory to life, um, and to, to show the kind of experiences that it is that we're ultimately looking to create. I'm going to play a short video uh, that we actually put together around six months ago um, in order to illustrate the kind of experiences we wanted to bring onto touchscreens. So we announced the game at the Apple keynote back in September when they announced the iPhone 6 and the iPhone 6 Plus, and back when, when we were able to showcase, if you like, what the metal technology can do on Apple devices. And if you haven't checked it out as developers, you should. It's an amazing API in order to create truly low-level graphics and high performance on, on touch screens. Um, we launched ultimately in November, staggered launch throughout the world in different regions at different times to make sure that we could keep up with our server load. And we've just been overwhelmed with the community response across the board. Um, we've, it's just been really amazing, and if you guys are watching on Twitch, thank you. I mean, it's just been amazing to work with all of you guys, and it's been amazing to work with like everyone from the dedicated players from the start who've been giving us loads of feedback, helping us improve the game, working with all the streamers, for folks like Shin Kagan or, or Dizzy Live and, and others, Don John, the Alvaro 845, all these folks who've really taken the game to their hearts and really helped teach their user base about it and all that. And, the things that have been really important to us when we sort of look at what have we, you know, what have we, what have we learned throughout this is that we didn't know. Remember those triplets that I showed earlier, the client-side tech and the distribution tech and the consumer acceptance? Like, we, didn't, we sort of knew that the tech was there, with a, the client tech was there, distribution was there, but we didn't know where consumer acceptance would be. And the thing that we've really been taken, you know, taken with is, like in January of just this past January, we had over... Uh, we had over 250,000 individual people watching our developer stream, for example. And that's we stream every Friday just to talk about, hey, what's going on with the game, what's coming up next, and play with viewers and all that, which has been amazing. The average player in the game plays more than 75 minutes per day. And that's the average, like including the people who just check the news feed. So we've just been overwhelmed with the very early stages of how our community have been interacting. And I myself, I actually run the Twitter account of the, of the game. 
and like I literally wake up in the morning, first thing I do is respond to some Twitter questions. I respond to Twitter throughout the day and, and in the evening. And it's just been amazing, the intensity and passion inside the community, it's been great. There's already loads of registered Vainglory teams out there. There's some tournaments being run, which is again, incredibly, we're super thankful for, and we know we need to build more tech in the, on that front uh, and all that, but gamers are truly ready for touch which is really, really good. It'll take years and years to build to make it really big, but we're just excited about our start. Couple of final lessons then, maybe meta lessons, call them that. Firstly, be patient with the future. The future will not happen tomorrow. There's loads of compound immaturity all the way out there, but the people who cut their teeth in making when the times are hard will be the people who will rule the world when the times will be easy. Secondly, funding models will evolve. When I started, $50,000 was enough to invest in a single game, and you could invest half a million dollars in a company that could make many games. Today, you need $5 million at least in order to pursue some of these opportunities. VCs must begin to think more like publishers and dare to take content risk, not publisher risk of a company that makes many, many, many games. Equally, publishers need to be more comfortable taking equity upside as opposed to controlling the destiny of a company through a revenue share or through some other form of... Uh, controlling their corporate development. But then finally, and perhaps most importantly of all, if I had listened to people who are experienced stand on stages like this, and I would have always listened to everything that they said, I would never ever have set up any of the companies that I set up. So take all established wisdom, including pretty much everything you've heard in this talk, with a massive bowl of salt. It's the most amazing time in the game industry ever. It is truly borderless. So many vectors of innovation in so many different directions. We are excited about ours and our community, but there are many others. And don't listen to me, go out and build them, because that's the kind of time we live in, which is so exciting. And with that, thank you very much.